Hi, I'm Dennis Kichiko, Senior Editor of Sky and Telescope Magazine, and I'm here at the 2010 Northeast Astronomy Forum, better known as NEAT, in Suffern, New York. And I'm talking now with Tim Puckett, the Astronomy Sales Manager for Apogee Instruments. Apogee builds very high-end CCD cameras, and they've been in business, you've been mailing CCD cameras for at least 20 years now, right? Almost 20 years. Yeah, almost 20 years. But before I get started, I want to say something. Um, last year, Tim, Tim isn't just a sales manager, Tim is also a user of this equipment. Uh, for many years he's been observing and, and uh, imaging the skies uh, going all the way back to the days of film. And last year there was a little bit of excitement just before Neef because Tim has formed an international group to search for supernovae in galaxies. And last year in the days just before Neef, they discovered a new supernova. So it was a little bit of news here. And I walk up to Tim today and Tim reminds me that in the last two days they've just discovered two more supernova. So their international team has really been doing very well. So congratulations on that. Thank you. So, and it puts the number well over 200 supernova discoveries, which I think is eclipses anybody, any other single group of people, right? Uh, that's correct, over oh, very 200. Good. All right, so tell me a little bit about your cameras that you have here today. Well, uh, okay, we're back here at Neve this year. We've got some of our most popular models uh, for astrophotography. Probably the most single, most popular model we have for deep sky imagers is our U16M. Uh, it's a 4K by 4K imager at nine microns. Um, so this it, is this is Kodak's biggest chip. It's in the amateur cameras. Well, it's the biggest chip within reason that we sell to uh, to amateurs. Okay. Correct. 16 megapixel. Right. Now we do sell a larger chip. We call it the U43. It's even larger than this one. But for the amateur market, the, uh, the 4K by 4K 9 micron is much better suited simply because, uh, you know, pixel per arc second uh, for scaling issues, you know, for, uh, for the proper arc seconds uh, per pixel, you definitely want to have uh, something that matches your telescope. Uh, the, this one can be bend two by two, uh, which works out to be 18 microns, or you can run it without bending at uh, nine microns. So, uh, that one is sort of a general all-use camera, at least for most of our uh, consumers. Yeah, very high sensitivity as well. The high sensitivity on this one is not that high. It's maybe about 60%, 65%. But you are getting a lot of real estate with, uh, with that size camera. You get a big chip for a really good price, which just, you know, four or five years ago, a chip like that would cost you thirty or $50,000. So uh, things have certainly come down in price, and they're a lot more affordable today. One of the things that I noticed is very nice about this is you've got this completely connected and there's only two simple connections as a power supply and then a USB and that's what USB 2, right? All right. So I know there's a lot more to a camera than just the chip that's in there and I know you've got some nice features in here. What are, what's new on the, the front end? Well, we've got two knife edge baffles now in the system. There's one inner baffle and one outer baffle. These are basically just black uh, knife edges. These are stainless steel and uh, they're uh, a special coating on them. So I know with these large chips, that helps eliminate a lot of stray light that's bouncing around inside of a telescope. And also, I mean, we've got the shutter open in this case, but the shutters in your cameras are, are well known for being very high-end, very high-end shutters. The cameras have a Mel's Brio shutter. Uh, they're a pretty expensive shutter, pretty reliable shutter. The uh, mean time to failure on these is about a million cycles. A million cycles. Yeah. All right. When you're making hour-long exposures, you don't have to use a lot of shutter cycles. No, they should last a customer uh, many years. All right. And I know this, this camera has regular cooling, but you've got another model here that's got the new high-end cooling. Yeah, that's our D9F uh, high-cooled camera right here. Um, it, uh, on the large chips, like the one you see here, uh, it cools to about uh, minus 60 to 65, and that's on our largest chips. You can also put an optional liquid assist to get rid of the fan array here. We can actually ship it with a liquid circulation back. Say if somebody's wanting to do spectroscopy or some way that they don't want any air currents or anything in an application, we can actually give it to them with liquid cooling. But the one you're seeing here has fan cooling. All right, so in other words, just with air cooling and the thermal electric cooler, you can drop the temperature, you said 65 degrees Celsius below the ambient. Right. Does the liquid go even further than that? Uh, I think the liquid is a little bit lower than that, so. Tim, tell me a little bit about the filter wheels. This is the new AFW57S, uh, the latest revision of this filter wheel. 
Uh, it has more ribbing in it, has more screws for stability. Uh, it also has a new knife edge baffling system in it. Uh, this is actually a coated stainless steel. Uh, it also has uh, mechanical positioning where uh, it'll actually go back against a detent and so you get precise positioning on every uh, filter wheel position which is important for photometry. Yeah, that's important if you want to do flat fielding and if you've got a little bit of dust on your filter it needs to come back to exactly the same spot each time. So this in addition to just rotating what it does when it gets to where it's going to go, it actually goes back against a hard stop to critically fix that position. So, and I do like the knife edge baffle in there. Once again, ability to reduce stray light scattered around in the telescope, prevent it from getting from the CCD. And as you said, you've got nice new, stronger structure here for the mounting. Well, one of the main things that's important that we've learned over the years is we really try to listen to our customers. Uh, if there's something that needs to be changed or if there's uh, something, somebody can find out a way to make something better, we're very good about listening to the customers and making changes. So. A lot of the uh, changes that we've made along in the last year or so are just changes that our customers have come and asked us to do, so we've been very attentive to the customer base. All right, that's good. And I, I noticed here, I mean, you've got a nice threaded aperture here. We can actually go back and look at some of the stuff on the cameras, but you're making these so that you can adapt them to virtually any telescope now, right? All the manufacturers are now making adapters for our cameras, uh, Takahashi Teleview, uh, this uh, plane wave, uh, RC optical, there's a lot of different places now that make adapters for us. So in other words, regardless of what telescope you've got, you can now get a, an adapter that will connect this camera right to it. I know you've got one here that you said this was for plane wave. Uh, this is off the new plane wave 24 inch uh, telescope that they've just come out with. So we uh, actually had this on their telescope and uh, took it off. This is their adapter plate. That's their adapter. So they're using the bolt pattern around the side. Some of the other adapters are using the threaded aperture here. In fact, I noticed you've got here one of um, Astrodon's off-axis guiders. And I see that that's made ready to fit right into the filter wheel. Those threads are right there matched to it. So you can pretty much rest assured that most of the major manufacturers of equipment are making it adaptable to your cameras, correct? Absolutely. We've been talking a little bit about your, your top of the line, your big cameras for amateurs, but you also have uh, a model that uses the Kodak 8300 chip, and I know that's been very well received in the amateur community lately. Uh, well, the 8300 is, seems to be a very popular model this day and age in astronomy. Uh, we sell those in both monochrome and color. Uh, they have very low noise, uh, very low dark current, and very low read noise. So you say monochrome and color. When you mean color, these are single shot color chips. You get a color image with a single shot. Sort of like a, a, a people think of with their digital cameras. It's sort of a souped up digital DSLR, really. It's a, a, a color chip. It's uh, cooled way down with uh, the noise eliminated from it. And uh, they're very popular in Europe. They're, they're somewhat popular here in the US. And that camera body uh, for the 8300 is a little bit smaller and a little bit lighter than the bodies that you're showing me here? Uh, they are. The uh, cameras here are 7 inches by 7 inches square. Uh, the 8300 is a 6 inch by 6 inch square camera. It's about an inch and a half thick. So uh, it's made primarily to go on shorter focus, smaller telescopes. I know that some of the world's best astrophotographers are working with Apogee cameras. I mean, you've got quite a display of images here that have been taken recently. We're really grateful to all the users we have, and we also have a very active uh, Yahoo users group, and uh, we invite everybody to come and join our users group and be part of the experience. What's the name of that? It's a Yahoo group, and the name is? It's, uh, it's the Apogee Yahoo group. Apogee Yahoo group. Actually, it brings up a good point. If people want more information on any of these cameras, they can go to your website. It's uh, ccd.com www.ccd.com. Well, Tim, I want to thank you very much for telling me about your cameras and the images that people have been taking with them, and I wish you luck in the future. I'm Dennis DiCicco, Senior Editor for Sky and Telescope Magazine here at the 2010 NEEF Conference in Suffern, New York.